I'd just like to take a couple of minutes to welcome you to this very important climate and health session uh, this morning. My name is Shyam Bishain, and uh, I head up the Center for Health and Healthcare at the World Economic Forum. As you just saw in this video, the topic of health impact from climate change is of global concern. This is something that we see from poor air quality, from heat, flooding, and hazardous uh, weather events. Climate change poses threats to human systems while exposing socioeconomic inequities. Not only global disease burden is gro growing, it's increasing quite fast, both in non-communicable as well as communicable diseases. Infectious diseases are no secret. Vector-borne diseases are growing quite rapidly. Uh, malaria, dengue, uh, Lyme disease, and all. Uh, we have seen the news reports, so I don't need to go in detail for that, and I've, our esteemed uh, panelists will discuss that. Uh, but there is a lot of focus. There is a lot of attention on uh, impact of climate change on health. We saw this in Dubai uh, during COP28. We saw that first time COP declared a health day, which was great. A lot of discussion on, on the impact on health, on human health. We saw about a billion dollar placed uh, on that one day, which is a great start, but I think we have a long way to go. We need about a trillion dollar to Im respond to the, um, all the impact on, on, on human diseases, on human health. Uh, so we have a long way to go, but it's a good start. We also saw about 123 countries coming together and signing a health and uh, health action uh, declaration. So I think we are on a on a good start here, and we need to do that. We need to take this urgent action here uh, because if we don't do anything, we have done some study with our partners, with Oliver Wyman, uh, where we see that if we continue the way we are we will have about 15 million additional deaths by 2050. That's a lot of lives lost that we can do something to stop now. Uh, we have a estimate of about $12.5 trillion in economic losses from the climate uh, impact on human health. So these are big numbers uh, to solve for some of these challenges. In parallel to the decarbonization efforts, mitigation efforts and goals, we also need to discuss across industry efforts on adaptation and preparing the health system. How do we make our health system more resilient uh, to climate change, you know, to the climate impact? And this is what we are doing at WEF, at the World Economic Forum, in our climate and health initiative. The human dimension of climate change and what are the most promising approaches? What is the evidence and data needed to address the impact of climate crisis today? We are working with our partners some of the partners are here as panelists uh, to, to, an to answer to some of those things. Uh, without further ado, I would like to hand it over to our moderator, Cheryl Moore, who is the Chief Programs Officer at the World Economic Forum. Uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> the Welcome uh, Trust. Uh, uh, this is my secret <laughs> desire, Cheryl, for you to move <laughs> over to the World Economic <laughs> Forum. But she's the Chief uh, Program Officer for now at the Welcome Trust. <laughs> so, Cheryl, over to you to moderate the session and introduce the panelists. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Sam. <laughs> thanks to everybody here in the room. Thanks for being here. And thanks to those of you online. Um, if you care to share your reflections on social, please use WEF. Uh, 24, uh, WEF 24, whatever year it is already. So um, a, a few introductory comments before I introduce our ex incredible panel. Climate change is here. Um, I don't think there's any argument about that. Uh, Copernicus, the EU space program, declared 2023 as the hottest year on record. Um, 24 with El Nino may exceed that. So this isn't uh, hypothetical anymore. And yet only a half a percent of the multilateral climate funding is allocated towards protection and improvement of human health. So this is an incredibly alarming statistic, given that about a quarter of the global burden of disease is linked to environmental risk factors that could be predicted and adapted to to protect the health of our populations. At the Wellcome Trust, climate and health is one of our key strategic programs. We've committed over 100 million pounds to supporting science to support, <coughs> excuse me, to underdress, excuse me, supporting science to understand and address the climate change health crisis. 
especially to support the most affected communities and populations. Climate change discussions and policies have to date focused largely on metrics like global surface temperatures and atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations. But these metrics fail to capture the human cost of climate change. We're all affected by climate change. People are already feeling its impact on health. Staple crops like rice, wheat, and soybeans are getting harder to grow uh, due to unpredictable rainfall patterns and hotter temperatures. Flooding uh, is increasing infectious disease risk, as we've heard, um, and can create stagnant water where mosquitoes breed, which is expanding the reach of vector-borne diseases. Um, poor health contributing, uh, caused by climate change is also undermining productivity and putting a costly load on our health systems. So we're starting to understand the impacts of climate change on human health, but there's more we need to learn. So to help fill that gap, Welcome is supporting projects in the following. We're funding research on pregnant agricultural workers in the Gambia, which has recognized the significant physiological impacts on the mother and the fetus who, during periods of increased heat. We don't know the long-term effects of this early life exposure, so we're funding 18 million pounds worth of studies in humans and animals to better understand the underlying physical reactions. Second, we're looking at the effect of climate change on fungal organisms. We know that over half of all known human diseases can be aggravated by climate change, but we don't know much about the impact on fungal pathogens. We don't know how they're adapting to changing environments or what can trigger them to become more harmful to human health. We do know that fungi are becoming increasingly resistant to existing antifungals. So we're looking at what adv advances are needed to protect human health. Third, we're seeing impacts on human health from climate change. And exposure to climate events like floods, droughts, and extreme heat can lead to psychological stress, um, which can trigger existing mental health programs, pro, pro, uh, problems or exacerbate others. We're working to quantify these impacts and to develop interventions to support mental health. Reliable evidence can drive discussions that lead to change. For example, Sham talked about the report that's coming out today that cites the potential for 14 and a half million deaths and $12.5 trillion worth of economic losses worldwide if we continue on the trajectory we're on. We have to take urgent global action to reduce emissions and to safeguard human health now. So it's great to see the increased awareness of the impacts of climate change on health, and we're encouraged to see many other organizations taking up these critical challenges. So to discuss how we can drive meaningful action in this space, we've brought together an outstanding panel. Um, with me today, I have Vanessa Carey, co-founder and CEO of Seed Global Health and WHO Special Envoy for Climate Change and Health. Bill Anderson, CEO of Bayer. Victor Zhao, President of the U.S. National Academy of Medicine. And Nicia Trindade Lima, Brazilian Minister of Health. A warm welcome to all of you. Thank you. So to start, let me just ask you to explain how climate change is affecting health in your communities. We'll start with Vanessa. Thank you. Um, and thank you, everybody, for joining this morning. I cannot think of a topic more urgent, actually, than the intersection of climate change and health. And I apologize that my back is to some folks. Um, the climate crisis is a health crisis, fundamentally. And that actually means it is a crisis, therefore, also of our stability, our security, our economic growth and our fundamental future as a globe. When we think about it, health is fundamental to everything that we are trying to do. But what this looks like in the communities where Seed Global Health works, which is in sub-Saharan Africa, is that a country like Zambia is now shutting down its schools because of a cholera outbreak that is from increased rainfall. In, mal in malaria is spreading in areas where it's been eradicated or removed in many of these countries. We are losing progress against our sustainable development goals. We have put billions of dollars towards those goals, and we're truly losing progress. We're now about to see the statistics of the deaths that we're seeing by 2050 is more than double what the statistics used to be. And, we, and for, with all due respect to this WEF report, which is fantastic, 
we're still catching up on the data, which is the point that Cheryl is making about the urgency of getting that evidence <laughs> so we can understand the problem that we are truly up against. This is not a future problem, though. We always talk in future numbers. This is a problem happening here and now today. 2023 was an apocalyptic year in terms of extreme weather events and what we've seen happen. That is about to get worse. We are on a target now for 2.4 degrees Celsius. They optimistically, if we come out of COP and we hold it, we could stay a little bit lower. But we're really at a, a crisis, and it's going to come down to two things. We have to phase out fossil fuels, because this is a crisis of burning fossil fuels, and we have to mobilize more money, not only to the mitigation, but to the adaptation and the resilience so that we can offset what is happening and protect communities. This is, Cheryl spoke about the fact that there's a human cost to climate change. Yet we always talk in degrees Celsius. As a colleague of mine always says, or has said, and actually it's a welcome trust, we should not be measuring our progress in terms of degrees Celsius sort of abated or averted, but in lives saved. And we are fundamentally, that is the fight that we are for. And the ramifications of this are significant. And it's worth noting, even beyond death, we're going to suffer more from the morbidity. That is the challenge we face, is the suffering from this. So this is a very real issue in our communities, whether it's in sub-Saharan Africa or in my home country, the United States, um, or, or wherever any of us are living. Thanks, Vanessa. Bill, coming from um, a different type of an environment, what do you, how are you seeing climate change play out? Yeah, thanks. Uh, really appreciate being here, and thanks for all of you for joining us today. It's a, it's a super important topic, and, uh, and Vanessa, I just couldn't agree more with what you said about we have to stop talking about this in measuring it in degrees Celsius and, and, and talk about it in lives because degrees Celsius is, is easy to be sort of academic about and, um, you know, to, can to kind of look at it coldly. But when you're talking about people dying, people lacking food, um, I think that's something that, that reaches people in a deeper place and, and maybe we can, uh, yeah, help to mobilize action with that kind of focus. I mean, at Bayer, we're a pretty unique company, uh, probably the only in the world that's focused on both human health and nutrition and food. Um, and so we're, we're seeing in operating in virtually every country in the world, we're seeing this sort of pernicious intersection of uh, food insecurity with leading to malnutrition, leading to disease. And uh, like many of you, I saw that the report from EU, you know, Copernicus Project, and the uh, I, when I saw it in the New York Times, whenever that was, ten days or two weeks ago, I sent it to a lot of my friends because it's not just degrees, but it's just saying, wow, how how much it's changing and how yeah. fast. And the thing is, I, I guess the question to the audience, um, and it's a bit of a rhetorical question, is, do you think that matters to farmers? Because a lot of us, we take for granted how the food gets to our table. You know, look at, uh, uh, at Davos. We have nice food, right? But we don't have to think about <laughs> where did that come from, uh, and and <laughs> right, and, and and what went into that. And and so as crops fail, which they are failing on an increasingly frequent basis, people don't eat. You know, in the West we have reserves, but in a lot of places that are most severely impacted by climate change. There's no reserves, and so um, we're, we're really focused on what can we do about this to help large farms but all the way down to smallholder farmers on how can we make crops more resilient, and hopefully we'll have a chance to talk about that a little more. But uh, what, what uh, I think what sticks with me is from the report, 700 million people at risk from severe weather events, 700 million more people, 1.6 billion life years lost between now and 2050. I mean, that's, that's just around the corner. And this isn't hypothetical. I mean, already last year, we, we heard from the uh, report published in The Lancet that heat-related deaths for over 65s are up 85% since the 90s, OK? So, so this, is getting, this is getting very real. And um, yeah, I'm glad we're here to, to get more action mobilized on it. Thanks, Bill. And yeah, I hope we can come back to talk a little bit more about crop science and what you guys are doing there. Great. So now we'll turn to the minister. Um, and she's going to speak to us in Portuguese. So yes. um, we, we who are in the room um, have a headset that we can use. Um, so give us a second while we put them on. Mm -hmm. And then perhaps you can share with us what's going on in Brazil. OK.
ideas, uh, but I would like first uh, thank very much for the invitation and thank everybody who is follow us. Uh, well, first point is uh, o primeiro ponto. É... Well, I think that the first point is at a political level. The current administration in Brazil, which took up the country in 2023, the Lula administration acknowledges the, cha the uh, climate change as a uh, central theme to health and all dimensions of social life. So a specific ministry was created for the environment and climate change. And Minister Marina Silva is sharing with me the discussions here at the World Economic Forum 2024. So that's the first point to acknowledge this as a major problem. The second point is to think about the impact on the overall conditions of the country, how it has taken place, and the impacts on health. These impa impacts have been wide-ranging and severe in the country. The first point considers the extreme rainfalls with floods, as was the case in 2023, and that is still taking place in 2024. Last year, the southern part of the country was severely affected, and in early this year, it has affected the southeastern portion of the country with different impacts on the population, especially in those areas which are considered more vulnerable, poorer areas. Areas where the population is predominantly of Afro descendants. At the same time, we have extreme drought in the Amazon region. All of these factors have left uh, uh, to different impacts on health. The interruption of essential services impact on the uh, diseases that are caused or transmitted or that are waterborne for example, the impact on the destruction on some health facilities. This is a severe and diverse impact. It is important to think about how disproportionate climate changes affect health. Data indicates that 60% of waterborne diseases in states of the Amazon region and of the northeastern part of Brazil affect uh, especially the black boss population. 75% approximately of the population in those states live in areas which are prone to landslides, which makes the situation even worse. For this reason, we're working and the adjustment and mitigation abilities of these effects. One last point related to this diagnosis refers to vector-borne diseases like mosquitoes, especially arbovirosis, uh, like dengue and malaria. In the case of dengue, we are currently living through uh, outbreaks and even an epidemic in some areas of the country which poses an additional challenge to us because new viruses and serotypes have come back because they were not circulating before. So this all leads to an overburden in the public health infrastructure and a severe impact in terms of mental health. This is a picture that calls for a vision of adaptation, mitigation, but also one of transformation in the social, economic, and developmental process uh, as a whole, which I could talk about later. Great. Thank you so much, Minister. Um, you've raised a number of important points about the spread of disease, um, other impacts. 
um, yeah. of flooding and <coughs> impact on the health systems, significant costs and challenges ahead. Um, thank you for that. And now to turn it over to Victor. Well, I can't agree more with my co-panelists about the major public health crisis that climate change is. It's also an equity crisis, has been uh, discussed before. So rather than repeating all this stuff, I would simply say that, first of all, in the United States, we saw one of the worst fires in Maui that's related certainly to tracking back to climate change. Uh, US, New York City has smog from Canadian wildfires, and I can go on and on, has been discussed so clearly. What I'd like to maybe focus on is the community in which I live in, which is the global health community, and the fact also in the climate community. Finally, we're getting climate and health really in the top of the agenda. In COP28, finally, we have a health day. It took 30 years for the climate community to recognize what an important issue this is, right? But I think what's really changing is, in fact, our own community recognizing that we are a big part of this, both in terms of addressing the uh, you know, health inequities and others in the public health, but also how we're contributing to a carbon emission. As you know, in the United States, 8.5% of total carbon by the health sector of total carbon emission, globally about 5%. It's really huge. When you probably put together US, UK, Canada, Australia, I think the health sector emission is equivalent to about, I think, number five or six in countries level of emission. I think the equity issue is very important. The minister talked about indigenous population, and of course we all recognize that countries like ours, the rich countries, emit two, three times more than 50% of poorest countries, and of course the impact on health is huge. I think for me are the following. One is, are we doing enough? I still think that in global health community, we're just coming around to it. A lot of people thinking because of pandemics, NCDs, but in fact, not as much in climate change. So I think that is, in fact, a very important pivotal point, inflection point. Great. I'm going to stop you there if I can, um, because there, I think you're absolutely right. There's a lot more we can and need to do. So let's, let's move to that now. Um, let's talk a little bit about a number of references have been made to COP28 um, and the fact that there was a health day and a real focus on protecting health um, at this year's COP which is really important. So Vanessa, maybe you can kick us off with um, your reflections on what you see as a path forward. Absolutely, I mean, I think, so COP28 was incredibly exciting because there was the first ever day of health. It's also worth noting that health made its way into the high level political day on day two, and that there was, um, so there was finally the, and it was the third day of COP, so it was the first thematic day, which I think really changed the primacy of it as well. Some very big and exciting things came out of this COP the word fossil fuel was finally used, right, as a driver of, of all this change. But it didn't go far enough in saying we need to phase out uh, without question. There was a lot of funding that was put on the table for climate and health. One billion dollars was pledged for funding. And I, um, it's terrific, but we can't be complacent in that. When the adaptation gap is already 387 you know, billion is what's expected sort of annually to begin to adapt. And we don't even know how much of that is health because we don't have the data yet fully. But of that one billion, over 800 million of it was pre-committed, pre-earmarked, right? So this isn't new money and this isn't available money. We are sitting here in Davos. This is some of the biggest wealth in the world. So when we talk about what we have to do in this moment, we have to think about how we can step into that gap more. And that's part of the next steps coming out of COP. And it's going to be really important that we actually deliver and we ask ourselves how we can step into that from the private sector, from the public sector, from every possibility to mobilize the kind of, of, of funding that is going to be needed for this moment. There was also the first ever climate and health uh, ministerial. 110 ministries of health showed up. 140 countries signed on to the climate and health ministerial declaration, which was an exciting first step. But we need to take it further. Very grateful to the Wellcome Trust for being such strong partners in this and for helping to lead what we should be talking about at the COP Day of Health. There's many partners that are in the room that have been helping with that. The WHO obviously has been playing a big leadership role in this. They help bring together that ministerial. They've run Attach, the Alliance for Transformative Action for Climate and Health. They are doing a lot to build out the vulnerability assessments and to drive some of that data. 
But again, all of this has to accelerate, all of this has to grow, all of this has to go faster. And I want to highlight that we, the mitigation question is critically important. We do have to mitigate the, the carbon contributions that the health sector is making. But if we don't step into that adaptation gap here and now, we don't address the fact that the most vulnerable in this world are being driven more into poverty and are dying at an increased rate and are going to suffer more, we are going to be increasing our instability. We are going to be increasing the political divides. We're going to be driving migration, driving food insecurity. We are not making ourselves safer unless we invest in health, well-being, and adaptation and resilience now. Absolutely. Thanks, Vanessa. I think one of the things that you've highlighted is that it is going to take a multi-sectoral approach um, and that it has to happen now. So we, I, we all need to look at where we have influence and what we can change. Um, so, Bill, maybe you can talk about um, what you all are doing um, at Bayer and particularly as it relates to, to crop science. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we need to talk about some things we can do because there's plenty of bad news. And I... I uh, I'm really excited about some of the opportunities we have in, in, in the world to, to change um, farming, to make it more resilient with respect to climate and, and to make sure we can provide food. Um, two, two examples that are very concrete, and, and one you're going to start to see this year in cornfields around the world. Those of you who have the occasion to drive through cornfields, mm -hmm. um, typically corn g grows about 10 feet tall, about three meters tall, and um, that is very natural, but it has a problem, which is when you have severe weather events, which are increasingly frequent, you lose a lot of the corn when it's mature because the stalks blow over, okay? And farmers can lose 30, 50, 60 percent of their crop to what's called lodging. And we've now developed what's called short stature corn. And this is basically, it's the same corn, but it grows six feet tall instead of 10 feet tall. And that has really important effects. One is you don't lose the yield to lodging. Second, um, with, with current corn, farmers have to decide usually to proactively spray pesticides at a certain point while they can still get their sprayers into the fields because the corn's so tall, once it gets past about six feet, they can't spray it anymore. So they spray it even if there's no pests because they can't, they can't afford to, to lose it later. With, with short stature corn, they don't have to spray. They can wait. And if they have no pests, then they don't have to spray. And so this is examples of things to make the food supply more resilient in a, in a, in a changing climate world. Another one which is huge is what's called direct seeded rice. So in most of Asia, rice is still grown with traditional methods, which requires flooding the fields. And when you flood the fields, you, you basically kill the weeds with water. Um, which sounds good, except it takes huge amounts of water and it leads to anaerobic uh, fermentation of the, of the weeds. They basically decompose underwater and when they do that, they release methane. And so actually rice production is one of the largest producers of methane, which is you know, many times more, more toxic in terms of greenhouse gas emissions than CO2. So we have an opportunity to replace that with so-called direct seeded rice that requires about 40% less water and 90% less methane production. Um, so these are examples that are they're good for farmers, they're good for eaters, and they're good for the environment. And, and these two innovations are rolling out really as we speak. So we need to accelerate progress on things like this. We have uh, uh, collaborations with, with health officials, including in Brazil, on uh, a treatment for Chagas disease, which is one of these tropical diseases that's now spreading to places where it hadn't been seen before. And um, this is, I, I think, a great example of the kind of partnerships uh, to, to actually make sure these medicines are available. And so, um, yeah, I, I know there's many more examples, but I, I wanted to share a few. That, that's fantastic. And, you know, food security is something that we need to realize is closely linked to climate change. Mm -hmm. um, so hearing the innovations that you guys are working on is, is really inspiring. Thank you. So turn it back to the minister. Um, perhaps you can share a little bit. Brazil is now president of the G20. Um, and you've set the motto of the health track as building resilient health systems. Maybe you can talk briefly about what it will take to build systems that are resilient to climate change. Great. Let me wait to you. <laughs> Oh, 
Não, de, uh, a primeira que... The first aspect which is important is to emphasize that we've proposed the idea of building resilient health systems while thinking about something that the South Africa Minister of Health mentioned yesterday at the meeting that we had with the different health ministries. We need to have the flag, as he says, of health at the top of the mountain. It needs to be seen by all. So this is very important. In order to build resilient health systems, we need to conceive systems that focus on equality and that are going to be developed and implemented hand in hand with other sectors of the government, civil society, and the private sector, so that we can have plans that reduce carbon emissions, that implement sustainable measures in the health system itself. Bill gave various examples about agriculture and what's being th done there. And of course, food security is very close and very important to have sustainable health system. I think it needs to be a joint effort by different ministries. And we need to get a head start to strengthen our systems, develop science and technology and innovation programs that favor the kind of solutions that we need for the health system, and talking more specifically about diseases that are very linked to the environment, I think we need to organize programs such as the one that we're going to present in Brazil, which is a program to eliminate these diseases that are very linked to the environment, such as Chagas disease, as well as many others, Hansoniasis, Hansen's disease, which is still a very strong health problem in Brazil. So we're working and we're proposing during the G20 presidency, and we will make as well a proposition along the same lines at COP30 to try and work on our health systems to make sure that they are better prepared in light not only of the health emergency, but also in light of climate emergency and its impact on health. So try to broaden the scope of our preparation and involve these two major challenges that our uh, society is facing today. Thank you very much. Um, really bringing together a lot of the things that we've talked about, including the cross-disciplinary effort that's needed to tackle these challenges. Thank you. So, Victor, very quickly, because we're, we're rapidly running out of time. I'm sorry. Um, that's a, the challenge of being uh, around the, that side of the table. Um, the National Academy has been working with different industries beyond health, the health sector, which you talked about before, such as construction, energy, and transportation. You've been gathering evidence and, and building consensus. So how are the impacts of climate change being felt and costed by those industries, if you can keep it very tight for us? Sure. I'd like to make two points. One is, when it comes to health, the entire sector has been involved, whether it is healthcare delivery, industry, public health, and, of course, supply chain, you name it. But I think in this issue that uh, all my panelists have mentioned, that is, in, at the end of the day, if you look at where the carbon emissions are coming from, three quarters from energy use, 20% from agriculture land use. So those have direct impacts on climate, which have impact on health. So that means simply we need to go beyond the health sector, look at all the other sectors. What are they doing? What kind of intervention? What kind of policy are they doing? That actually impacts human health and well-being, and that's not being measured. I mean, I really appreciate what Bill's talking about in agriculture. But in fact, there are things like biochar and many other gener regenerative agriculture where you are looking at how to grow these crops. But the direct impact on human health has not been as measured. So food security going from there to say, there's evidence we're improving health. Energy, you know, carbon capture, 
People say carbon capture is a good thing, but have you thought about the local pollution and the marginalized populations that's going to be affected by this? And because you can go on and on, transportation and many others. So I think in the consideration is that we need to first have data, look at each sector, not in silo, but their impact on health, and we need to bring them together. And what we're working on is a new economic model called economic model of climate and health and equity economic model led by Judy Road and others. Look at how all these things intersect. That's research and policy. Thank you. And that, that's a really nice uh, note to end on because um, we've kind of come full circle talking about the need to quantify what the impacts are um, and then to really um, look for innovative ways to move forward. We have time for one question from the audience. Um, so I'll let, uh, we'll go right here. Thank you. <laughs> Behind me, why not? Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. please yes. quickly identify yourself and okay. quickly ask. My name is João Pedro. I'm a Global Shapers from Rio de Janeiro Hub, Brazil. Um, I have a, a fast question. I think that's two questions in one. Um, first of all, Bill mentioned the importance of farmers, which I think that's huge. And for, for myself as an urban farmer, I think that's, uh, that they should be in the health system because they provide us three, three meals per day at least. So, um, but I do think that farmers has a if really I can get good you to quickly farmer question. partner yeah. that's a bi biodiversity. So uh, is it possible we feed, Bill, uh, is it possible we feed the world uh, with diversity food and guarantee this access uh, while we try to don't lose biodiversity? And also, uh, Nisa mentioned how to build a uh, health system resilient. Uh, is it somehow civil society, Brazilian civil society, can contribute for that? OK, let's take the first question, which is about biodiversity. Can you, can you kick us off? Uh, the, the short answer is yes, it's possible. And it takes a lot of work. And um, right now, too often, we have the, 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 you know, the people that are innovating in agriculture and many people who are active in agriculture policy the guns are sort of trained on each other, and we need to stop that and start working together because we, we, um, these goals of feeding 10 billion people and having biodiversity, they're not mutually exclusive, but we're not going to get there on the trajectory we're on today. So we, we've, got to, we've got to start much more dialogue between those parties. Thank you. Great. Um, if I think we're going to have to move on because we're close. I think we could do one more question if someone would be tight. Yes, please. If we can get a mic. Mas eu não respondi. Ah, so, yes, yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry. No, I'm sorry. I messed up. So apologies. Uh, please, Minister, if you can respond to the civil society question. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry I speak with you in Portuguese. <laughs> no, no, no. It's all right. Thank you. Please. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, So yes, João Pedro, it's very important to think about the role of civil society. In this sense, Brazil has a historic experience that it has brought back now with Lula's administration of having the participation and social control, as we call it in Brazil, as an integral part of the health system and the historic experience we've had with over 30 years of this being applied through the formation of a national health council as well as local councils is something that we have been sharing and we shared during the last World Health Assembly. It was a very positive event, lots of challenges in terms of different ideas, and we will bring that experience to the next uh, assembly of having perhaps a resolution about the need for uh, civil society participation in global health systems. So that's the opportunity we have, and I invite you, João Pedro, to join the initiative. Excellent. So a real emphasis on civil society and the opportunities there. Thank you. Um, so if, I, if you can ask your question really concisely, that'd be great. Well, the question is, thinking about this, if health wasn't the driver for the COP movement, what was? <laughs> and if after 30 years now we see what we thought would happen if the temperature rises to the point it has, 
And if, as you say, Ms. Carey, that we're, at, we're going to be at 2.4, and if 2 was the tipping point, isn't what we're just doing now is talking about adapting to a situation that's irreversible? Thanks, thanks for that provocative question. Um, I think to go back to what something Vanessa said earlier, that the climate crisis is a health crisis, absolutely 100%. Um, and if, if there was um, slow uptake on that question, at least we're there now. Um, and I think we do have to be thinking about adapting. So we do need more research. We do need um, more data. We do need to understand physiological impacts, environmental <coughs> impacts, so that we can quip quickly put all of our strength behind developing solutions because we are out of time. Yeah. I just want to add one quick thing of optimism, though, is that we, we've been on track for 2.4. If we do what we say we're going to do coming out of this COP, we accelerate that commitment and we follow through with it, we're not going to be at 2.4. We can be well below. But the reality is at 1.5 or 1.4 where we are now, we are living a very tough reality and it's about to get worse. So we do have to do that adaptation. But I don't want us to lose optimism because we should have optimism, we should have action. And that's going to be incumbent on every single person at this Davos and beyond to be a part of a solution. And I, but I want to make sure that we're just clear on that option. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to have to wrap us up because we are out of time. So we've, we've had an incredible discussion here, and I really want to thank the panelists. We've heard about different aspects of society pulling together in their areas of expertise to make change. So the National Academy talking about convening different industries and quantifying change um, that's needed. Um, the WHO has made um, climate and health a cross-cutting priority in its latest general program of work. Um, Brazil is really showing leadership in global agenda setting in climate and health and working to build resilient health systems um, and bring together civil society more broadly. Welcome is funding research into the health impacts of climate change um, and Bayer is protecting health through crop science um, in many different ways showing incredible innovation. So as we see increased climate change, we must protect human health. We must respond to the changes around us with prompt and decisive action, with innovation and with extended commitment. We have to protect our health and the health of future generations. So we really encourage everyone to join us in this and to take action in the coming year where you individually hold influence. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you.